Welcome to our podcast, Psychiatric Services from Pages to Practice. In this podcast, we highlight new researcher columns published this month in the journal Psychiatric Services. I'm Lisa Dixon, editor of Psychiatric Services, and I'm here with podcast editor and my co-host, Josh Barrison. Hi, Josh. Hey, Lisa. We're here again. Amazing. And it's, Every month. Yes, it, it happens, and that's so. <laughs> I'm so happy about that. We've if recovered from the APA. Uh, that is true. We just hope. barely, just barely. <laughs> right. Only time will tell. Yeah. And by the APA, we're meeting the American Psychiatric Association meeting that took place in New York. And beware when the meeting takes place in your hometown. Uh, you try to do too much. So anyway, we are here. And we're going to talk about three articles. Imagine that. <laughs> three articles from the journal that have recently been published online, as I have already alluded to. Okay. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about um, something called self-directed care. Now, the title of the article is Housing and Employment Outcomes for Mental Health Self-Direction Participants, and I am not going to list all the authors. The first author is Bevan Croft. Next, after that, we'll be talking about an article that I had something to do with, and so I'm kind of excited about it. It's an article about the outcomes and experience of On Track New York, a coordinated specialty care program first author on that is Alana Nossel. And then finally, very interested to talk with you about an article. It's a, it's a first-person personal account article uh, by Pat Corrigan on uh, the disabling effects of mental illness on my education. First up, we have Bevan Croft, Kevin Mahoney, and co-authors on housing and employment outcomes for mental health self-direction participants. So once again, I'm, I am learning a lot by hosting this podcast. I didn't know anything about self-direction, but this is something that's kind of catching uh, fire in the, in the mental health services community. A little bit, yeah. You know, I, I, I maybe catching fire may be too strong a There's statement. an ember. <laughs> right. An ember that is glowing. How about yeah. that? Right. But, you know, and it's, but it's, it's not, sometimes when I think about ember, I think of it as sort of, you know, dampening down. This is really the beginning. It's like the kindling. Kindling. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. So this is um, something that... Enough um, with the metaphors. Enough right? with the metaphor. We can actually... <laughs> no more fire here. Uh, so um, what, what is, is it? <laughs> it's actually yeah. something that allows participants, with the help of a coach, to decide how they are going to spend a portion of mental health dollars that go towards them anyways. I think that the best way to describe it is actually to describe the program that's described mm-hmm. in the study, which is called Florida SDC. It's a good example. So there's actually two programs in Florida. They serve about 330 adults with serious mental illness who are relying on or applying to public funds to pay for their mental health services. So if you're enrolled in one of these programs, you get a budget of $1,900 a year or more than that if you don't have insurance. So you get this additional money and what happens is you work with a coach and your person-centered recovery plan to try and see how you want to spend the money to meet your personal recovery goals. One of the notable things about this uh, self-directed care is that people can purchase things that, that wouldn't necessarily be health care. Right. So in this program, again, it's a good mm-hmm. example. The expenditures were top three were on transportation, dental care, and psychiatric medical services, but the, also using things for housing, employment, computers, hobbies, clothes, utilities, education. It's really up to them what fits into people's personal recovery goals, what they want to spend their right. money on. You know, it reminds me of a story. Uh, Steve Sharfstein, who's a very prominent psychiatrist, he ran Shepherd Pratt for a long, long time, and, and he, he wrote uh, about uh, something that occurred early in his career when he actually wrote uh, a prescription for a washing washer-dryer right. on a prescription pad. Right. <laughs> and, it, and it really just points out, and I think the self-directed care uh, uh, initiatives make it clear that people need and can benefit from a lot of different things to make them healthier. Yeah, so instead of a prescription pad, it's a checkbook. Well, there it, you go. In a and, way. Yeah. So this is another quasi-experimental design. We've talked about a couple other papers in the past that have this this design. Mm-hmm. And in this case, the Florida or the agencies that are administering this program collects demographic and outcome data on all the participants, but they also collect data on a larger cohort of people who have serious mental illness. So basically what you have 
are an intervention group of people who've gotten the intervention. And then you also have this sort of control group Mm -hmm. that you have who are similar and you have similar data on about demographics and outcomes. How do you feel about that description of a quasi-experimental design? Well, it's it's a good beginning of the <laughs> Thank quasi-experiment. You. Thank you. Thank you very but much. I, I think the, the important thing to really reflect on a bit here is that in this in, in an experiment or in, in this kind of a study, we're trying to figure out whether the intervention, in this case self-directed care, is causing the observed differences, you know, in 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 the uh, between the two groups. And so, what they did in this study is they tried to match the groups uh, on uh, f- f- demographic factors and other factors that they had information on. So what they're left with are 271 people who got the intervention, mm-hmm. participated in the program, and 1,099 people who didn't get the intervention. So what did they find, Josh? So after controlling for covariates, they found that participating in the STC program Increase the odds of having a positive outcome in days work for pay by a factor of Mm 1.73 and increase the odds of maintaining or attaining independent housing by a factor of 2.04. And both of those were statistically significant. I like the number needed to treat presentation of the data because I think it's easier to wrap your, um, your head around. So for one positive employment outcome, you would need to enroll 18 people for three years. And for a positive housing outcome, you need to enroll 16 people. And that three-year period is the mean enrollment length of time for the program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I mean, it's not necessarily the most impressive impact or effect size, but still, again, it's progress. Yeah, and it's also just such an interesting model to be presenting as well to really get people thinking about how these sorts of programs could be helpful for people. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think that it's innovative, it's recovery-oriented, it, it puts decision-making authority in the hands of, the, of affected individuals and in the hands of affected individuals with help. Mm-hmm. So in other words, one of the things about this, it's not just like, here's your money, okay, you know, let us know when you're done. It's supported. So the process is supported by a, a counselor and a um, uh, uh, a coach, coach, and right. it's linked to your recovery goals. Yeah, as well. It's yeah. it's not just a uh, a blank check. Yeah, and you know it's one of these things where I I tend to think of this as a little bit as sort of self directed care or sh- shared decision making meets income supports because there's a little bit of giving people discretionary income here even though there are some constraints around it so that's how i think about self-directed care is a little bit shared decision making meets income support you know i had the thought that it was kind of in line with the move towards value uh value-based payment in our in our healthcare system where we're giving uh, healthcare entities sort of a chunk of change and letting them figure out how best to spend the money that we're sort of it's a way of kind of passing that down to mm-hmm. the consumer level as well and you know that I, the hope would be that the kind of closer you get to the consumer they're going to be able to be the like in a shared decision making way be the real experts in themselves and exactly. really know what they need the best yeah. Another just final point about this study is clearly we need more research in this area. Uh, this is a really complicated study because the the study design is complicated and it was challenging to find a proper control group for this population and it's it really would be lovely if we could do a randomized trial of this intervention. All right, uh, pages to practice 2020. We'll uh, we'll see you then. <laughs> no, it's going to be before then. 2019. Next up, we have Alana Nossel, Lisa Dixon, Ooh. and co-authors. Did I write this? I hmm. think you may have on the results of a coordinated specialty care program for early psychosis and prediction of outcomes. So I have been itching to do an author interview on the podcast, <laughs> I think, from day one, and it's finally happening. So I'm, I'm happy to talk about anything related to first episode psychosis care, or co- what we now call coordinated specialty care. So actually the, the, the story 
can, we can probably begin this story in, in the year 1900, but I won't do that, Josh. Okay. We'll, we'll only we're, go we're back. We'll shoot for seven minutes. <laughs> so um, there were the raised studies. The raised studies actually began somewhere around 2008 or 2009. Two big studies were funded to test models of early psychosis or early first episode psychosis care. Um, they were tooling along and suddenly, and actually one of them, the, the, the not randomized trial, the results were in in 2013, the big randomized trial conducted by Dr. John Kane and his uh, colleagues as a part of the Navigate study, the results of that study didn't, weren't reported until 2015, but lo and behold, in January of 2014, President Obama signed legislation that increased the mental health block grant by five uh, percent to each state, which added to which added about twenty five million dollars. Not huge amount, but this twenty five million dollars, new money to provide evidence based early psychosis care in the United States. And why did that happen before even the results of the big study uh, were uh, known? Well, it, it happened because research and advocacy and community violence and doing the right thing all kind of came together at the same time. We have the research lining up, we have the advocacy lining up, we have financing and funding lining up, and suddenly before we know it, we have a little bolus of money. Which is not always common. It's uncommon. And then not only that, not only that, then we get the research findings in Uh 2015 from John Cain's Ray study. And then we get an increase in the, in the money from $25 million to $50 million. And suddenly we go from a nation where there's virtually no services for young people experiencing early psychosis that are evidence-based and, and recovery-oriented and focused on their goals uh, to having virtually every state in the nation um, uh, having a plan and some services. So let's fast forward now to 2018 or so. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be the right present. Now. Right now. <laughs> that yeah, would be I the think present. So. <laughs> that would be the present moment in the real world. Yes, here we <laughs> so. are, back in the real world. So now we have this evidence base for these early psychosis interventions that have been through some of the trials um, and studies that you were just alluding to. Mm -hmm. And now we also have implementation of these programs. And you have been integral in creating and maintaining New York's OnTrack program. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can just say like a few words about what OnTrack is and and how it runs, and and then we'll actually dive into the study. Yeah, so OnTrack New York is New York State's Coordinated Specialty Care Program. The program is basically just an, uh, an exi- you know, it's based on coordinated specialty care principles, and it has uh, pharmacology and primary care coordination. It has case management. It has family support and education. It has psychotherapy, which is cognitive behaviorally oriented and kind of uh, community oriented. And it has supported employment and education. This is, this is it's essentially state of the art care for people with first episode psychosis. Mm-hmm. This is what it, care should look like for this population. Yeah, well, and some would argue it's what care should look like for every person who experiences serious mental illness, and and even people who just need psychiatric services. But we we'll won't start, go there. We'll start. <laughs> right, right, right. That'll be the next. Right. Uh, I, I did want to add also that in the last maybe a year, I think now. Uh, the program has added peer services. Uh huh. So again, you have this evidence base from studies, and now you have an implemented program that's actually very similar to what the research base is as mm-hmm. well. And so this paper that you co-authored is really looking to see what happens in the real world when you implement this program, and do, do the results sort of track with what mm-hmm. you have seen from the the research base? Exactly. So. In its implementation of OnTrack New York in New York State, the state uh, leadership had the wisdom to collect data and collect data not just using claims but also um, to get more uh, sort of qualitative, qualitative types of data and data about service utilization and data on symptoms and data on 
work outcomes, which you wouldn't necessarily get from, say, a Medicaid claims. And I should say also that this program is offered not just to people who have Medicaid coverage, but to people regardless of their insurance coverage. So what this paper did was it took the first 325 individuals or 325 individuals who had a, um, a baseline and, a, and one follow-up three-month assessment and looked at what happened to them over their first year of care. In terms of their functioning, mm-hmm. hospitalizations? Yes, their occupational functioning, including school and work participation, their social functioning, and their symptoms, and then also their use of hospital. So what did you find, Lisa? Well, so, so this is where it gets kind of interesting because, you know, we just had a whole long discussion about the importance of control groups. Uh-huh. <laughs> we'll and which, here you have we'll me <laughs> advocating the table for, for the good, for good We should have done that in the opposite, right, opposite right. order. <laughs> we didn't have a control group here. This was, a, this was a, a, essentially a trajectory analysis. And what we found, though, was um, that people markedly improved in all of these domains, in terms of social, occupational uh, functioning and symptoms, and had significant and marked reductions in use of hospital, and marked increases in participation in school and work. And so- It's, a, it's too bad that we're on, on a, a, an audio format, because I think though people can really get a sense for the outcomes if they just look at a couple of your figures, where you really see really drastic improvements over the first three months. We would months. think of those as not, drastic would probably be like a negative word. Maybe we'd want to use something like exciting improvements. A drastic improvement, I guess, <laughs> might be a little bit of an oxymoron. So impressive improvements. There we go. There um, we go. Stunning? Is that yeah. too much? Yes, okay, so excellent. stunning improvements <laughs> in, uh, in these outcomes. And so you'll see over the first three months that there really are these large gains that are then maintained throughout the six, nine, and 12 months of assessments right. as well. Yeah, and you see that, just to, to make it sort of quantitative, in our cohort, the individuals who enrolled with about a 40% rate of participation in school and work, and that, that essentially doubled going up to, say, 70 80% over the first year. So th- that is something that we really track very closely. Now, again, I just want to say that we don't have a control condition, so we can't say, well, they did better th- with this program than they would have done with mm-hmm. you know alternative service and so we have to be extremely cautious about attributing uh, causation but what we can do is compare the findings of our program to uh, the findings or to the results of other similar programs and we're certainly in the game if not even a little better in certain ways What's unique about this is that it is a real-world program with real-world data seen by real-world clients and not under research conditions, Uh, so we think it contributes uh, to knowledge in that way. Uh, But I would say there's a lot more work to be done, and we should implement these programs. (laughs) If we look at our data in other ways, we see a group, a small group, who never, who are not in work and school at the beginning, and they're not in work and school at, at any time point. And so we're trying to understand who those folks are and how we can help them maybe from the beginning, maybe we need to support cognition better, maybe we need mm. to, to, maybe it's substance use. But you know, we are learning so much here. Our clinicians in New York State are, are making all these observations, everything from the importance of trauma, how you deal with suicide prevention, issues of sexuality, um, I, I just I, the list is is very very long in terms of what we think we can do better and and we want to try to do it systematically in the real world. Lisa, thank you for joining us for our <laughs> first uh, first author interview. I hope it won't be our last. Yeah, thanks, Josh. <laughs> Appreciate it. Last up, we have Patrick Corgan on the disabling effects of mental illness on my education. So this isn't a randomized control trial or a a prospective um, longitudinal. Or (laughs) quasi-experimental. No, this is um, a personal account column. Um, And I I think uh, we were just talking about this, like just to give people a little bit of context about, uh, about this. Who is Patrick Corrigan? So let's Google Patrick Corrigan. And Patrick Corrigan is a giant. Patrick Corrigan is a distinguished professor of psychology at the Illinois Institute of Technology. 
He is principal investigator of the National Consortium for Stigma and Empowerment, uh, a collaboration of investigators and advocates from more than a dozen institutions, and so forth and so on. He has written more than 400 peer-reviewed articles, is editor emeritus of the American Journal of Psychiatric Rehabilitation, and editor of a new journal published by the American Psychological Association, Stigma and Health. And by the way, he's also authored or edited 15 books. Okay, so this is the last person on earth who you would have expect to have had any trouble in an academic career, right? He is like at the pinnacle of, of an academic career and is making major contributions to the field. But this personal account is really about how his own struggles with depression, anxiety, and uh, mood issues really almost derailed him from being able to um, achieve a lot of his goals. So just briefly, he outlines this process where he was on track, to borrow a term mm-hmm. from our last paper, did... Um, to becoming a physician. To becoming a physician, right. that's right. He had excelled in college and went to medical school and sort of had expected things to continue on the same trajectory, but found the experience to be just incredibly overwhelming the medical school experience the medical school experience to be incredibly overwhelming and filling him with with anxiety so just read very briefly what he he writes about that experience um even though i was in a classroom of 100 students i felt alone as if i were yelling in the crowd and no one could hear me i ran out into the quad but did not know where to go i experienced dissociative feelings of being apart from everyone and failing badly i became depressed So he struggles through his first year of medical school, takes a leave, comes back for the next semester, but realizes that he's not going to be able to to complete it because the the anxiety and the self-doubt is just too strong. So then he tries to go for a PhD in clinical psychology, but his panic symptoms come back and a week later he stops doing that program as well. He goes instead and gets a master's degree and then tries to get a PhD at the University of Chicago and only makes it two days before these symptoms return. Then he finishes a PsyD in clinical psychology, doing his postdoc at UCLA, and six months later, he's overwhelmed by self-doubt and leaves the program. I have to say that I just, when I read this, I thought there's so much in here that is so important and you know, one of the things, both in terms of what our agenda needs to be and why. So why did he write this? He wrote this, as he says, because, quote, my 400-page textbook on psychiatric rehabilitation includes only four pages on supported education. So here we have this person who is almost like the poster child for struggling with education and he in his career years later realizes that neither he nor anyone else has adequately focused on what we need to do to help people as they're struggling to take advantage of educational opportunities. So the the column then goes on to talk about what we now offer or what the current state of affairs with supported education is and where we have to go. Yeah, and he's using his own experience as saying, like, would these things have actually worked for me? So one thing is, you know, reasonable accommodations where you... Give people a longer time to take a test. Which is great. We're not arguing against reasonable accommodations. Mm-hmm. Like, a lot of people need that, and it's not mm-hmm. a bad thing. But what he's saying is, like, does that would that actually have helped me in my struggles mm-hmm. with... He didn't get it to... He didn't make it to the tests. Oh, right. So that wouldn't really have helped. And mm-hmm. um, similar, there's, like, an idea that you could train somebody with kind of behavioral skills or stress management or right. something like that. But he's also so that, and that notion is sort of giving people tools before they go into the educational setting so that they can apply them in the educational setting. Right. But he's also skeptical that that actually would have helped in his situation. Right. Well, right. it sounds like from reading it that he was already at like a 10 and right. that, um, that that wouldn't have... Way past the point that stress management could have helped. Right. right. And then also he you know, talks about how there was um, somebody in his life who was very supportive and yeah. offered just Father basic... Father Skull, a, a minister, a, a, a priest. Yeah. yeah, who offered just some basic support to him as well, um, which again, we're not arguing against basic support or anything like that, but that it wasn't really quite 
enough. enough. There has right. to be something after the hug. Right. And so, again, it's a springboard to start thinking through what might actually um, what actually might work for supported education and what that might look like. Right. And, and he alludes to the fact that supported employment job coaches assist people on the job in the moment, helping them interact with supervisors and coworkers when necessary. So maybe you know, there's an analogy to supported employment that supported education can learn from. I think that I'm aware that certainly in the work in the first episode space that we just talked about, we do a lot of supported education because our young people are, many of them are in school. And so we're trying to figure this out as we go along as well. And I know that Bob Drake and others who have developed supported employment are, are focusing some of their attention on supported education. There are others doing this. So I think that we can look forward in the next several years to the work of Corrigan and others really putting some evidence-based meat on the bones of what we hope will be a more effective supported education strategies. So Josh, another podcast, another exciting three articles, three articles. Uh, Just like always. (laughs) (laughs) Consistency. There we go. Something can be consistent in life. Um, We're done. Uh, Let me start and go to my script. (laughs) We invite you to visit... <laughs> We're so, off the rails in the uh, outro. Yes, there we go. Let's push through it. <laughs> okay, I'm warm. It's Mother's Day. i got to go to my mom's. Okay. We invite you to visit our website, ps.psychiatryonline.org, to read the articles we discussed in this episode, as well as other great research, and not just research, but stories, human stories that matter for healthcare. We also welcome your feedback please email us at psjournal at psych.org and you can rate and review the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to it. I'm Lisa Dixon. I'm Josh Bearson. Thank you so much for listening. We will talk to you next time. Happy Mother's Day. Thank you. Thank you.